Yesterday, I received a very interesting notification on Facebook that I'll share with you now. Karen Schiller Kripke sent me a little note saying, I was just reading the article about Saul Kripke, our cousin, who died two days ago. No need to connect with me. Well, replied, I asked for more information, and she did not reply. So it's interesting to me when people do that. They read an article that I wrote or published. They contact me saying, hey, I read your article, and by the way, Saul Kripke's dead. Later. So we'll reflect a moment on the life of Saul Kripke. This is one of the articles published on Bowles Blogs, written by Andreas Sogstad, in 2001. And the title of his article is Saul Kripke, Genius Logician. I won't read the whole thing for you here, but I will publish the link to this blog article on our Discord server and our live chat area, so you can check it out later. This is how Andreas started his article about Kripke. Saul Kripke is one of the greatest thinkers in modern philosophy. Now that's big <laughs> to say that about a man. He is one of the few academics today who can be characterized as a living legend. And many people don't even know his name. Many people don't know who Saul Kripke is. For many years, he has been professor of philosophy at Princeton University in the USA. When he visited Oslo to give a lecture at my university, I met him at a local restaurant to do an interview. The image below of Kripke and me on the streets of Oslo was taken by Helga Skrbeck. Now, isn't that beautiful? There's Saul Kripke. There's our friend Andreas. And then he goes on to explain to you, dear reader, why Saul Kripke is a super duper a genius. Part of his conclusion, Kripke is a peculiar man with a sharp intellect. He talks fast and he thinks perhaps even faster. One is still stricken by the fact that he does not seem vitally concerned about applying philosophy to social issues. His ideals do not seem to be those of the visionary public intellectual, like Sartre, Russell, Chomsky, or Cornell West. Kripke is one of America's most respected philosophers. Still, he is not significant in public debates. But the mind-body problem is perhaps not so big after all. And here is a little secondary article that I wrote that Andreas wrote in 2005. Just called Saul Kripke, which is a reflection of that previous article. This was an update, I believe, by Andreas. Saul Kripke is a good Omaha boy who made fine use of his gifts for the world beyond the Midlands. And he, the reason I remember now that Andreas wrote this article was because he had moved uh, from Princeton to the City University of New York and the Graduate Center. So who is Saul Kripke? And what is he doing here? Here we go. Saul A. Kripke, American philosopher. Now are there many? I can't think of a lot of people today 
dead or alive, who have that after their name. American philosopher. And when you do a search on him on Google, this is what you get. A long list of fantastical achievements. Wikipedia page, his books, the infamous, in a good way, naming a necessity, Wittgenstein on rules, and private language. And this is the life of a man. There are videos. Very open. Here's his Wikipedia page with that wonderful face and that beautiful beard. The genius mind of a man. And his life. And this is somewhat difficult, but here's a little bit from his Wikipedia page. Kripke is partly responsible for the revival of metaphysics after the decline of logical positivism. Positivism. <laughs> Bagelman. Claiming necessity is a metaphysical notion distinct from the epistemic notion of a priori and that there are necessary truths that are known as a posteriori such as that water is H2O. A 1970 Princeton Lecture Series published in book form in 1980 as Naming and Necessity is considered one of the most important philosophical works of the 20th century. It introduces the concept of names as, red, as rigid designators, true in every possible world, as contrasted with descriptions. It also contains Kripke's casual theory of reference, disputing the descriptivist theory found in Gottlob Frege's concept of sense and Bertrand Russell's theory of descriptions. Complicated stuff, heavy stuff, really interesting stuff, the stuff of life that matters, and that mind has now been silenced by death. Another tribute, 1940 to 1922. Saul Kripke, one of the most influential analytic philosophers of the 20th century, has died. If you want to measure a life, one way you can do that is by going to Encyclopedia Britannica. And look, Saul Kripke, American logician and philosopher. Born 1940, aged 81, dead now, naming a necessity. Here is everything that he has done, why he's done it, what it means, how the truth influences us, meaning and skepticism, I will put all these links on our Discord server. And we turn to social media. There he is. No beard. Shaved off his beard. The Kripke Center. He had a whole center named after him at the City University of New York, CUNY. Graduate Center. We mourn the passing, but celebrate the life and achievements of Saul Aaron Kripke. His family and friends ask for privacy at this time. It saddens me a lot to know that my favorite philosopher and logician, Saul Kripke, has passed away. May he rest in peace. His brilliant works shall shine forever amongst the most influential in history-making masterpieces of philosophy. The Saul Kripke Center housed at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. The Saul Kripke Center is dedicated to preserving, publishing, and promoting the work of Saul Aaron Kripke, one of the greatest living logicians and philosophers.
put this link also in our Discord server chat. Saul Kripke Center. There's his bio. A recent photograph of the man. And so we are left with the remains of a life. And what does, what does it mean as human beings searching for meaning, naming, necessity, inveiglement in a very confusing world where we believe we see things and we understand what things are and there are other people around us who try to change the meaning of those things. For example, my example, not a Saul Grimke example, if we hold in our hand an apple, does that apple represent one and one thing only, an apple? An apple is not an orange. An apple is not a socket wrench. An apple is not a banana. And some argue that all over the world, when you present someone with an apple, no matter the language difference, the intellectual concept, cultural conflicts, you can agree that this thing is an apple, no matter what label you apply to it, or what definition you try to change it to, to match your dysfunctional imagery or intention. But throughout languages and time and space, an apple, whatever it is named, is inherently one and one thing only, an apple. And that perhaps is the lesson and the warning from the life of Saul Kripke. There are things we know to be distinguished truths that can have different names, but that doesn't change what they are. We don't have to negotiate meaning. We don't have to negotiate how this fits into that because without any intervention from any human being, the apple remains an apple. Now, are there people in the world who will try to convince you that this orange is an apple? It looks different, it tastes different, but we can call it an apple because it's a fruit. And if you want an orange to be an apple, well, why don't we just say that an orange is also a bridge? Good for you, wakes you up in the morning, gets you a certain place. That's how people try to entangle the truth and universally agreed upon decisions to confuse you. The sky, not the heavens, the sky above is the sky. And there are people who try to convince you that that's not the sky, that's the ocean. That the sky is not blue, it's actually green. And then the media steps in and says, well now there's a dispute. These people over here are saying the sky is blue. And there are people on the other side that say that the sky is actually green. And what are we going to do? How are we going to have some kind of resolution or definition? And I believe Salt Kripke would say we can't get into that conversation. We know what, where, how, and when a sky is, how a sky behaves, what it is, what it's made of, and that's it. And there are other people who say, well, we have a world, and it's not round, it's flat. So are you defining what the world is as something flat, or are you defining that the world is something round? 
These are the confusing terms, not of endearment or of enlightenment, but of political deception that can lead one astray from basic universal truths that have belonged to each of us every single day. An apple is an apple, the sky is the sky, and the world is as you find it. There is no debate if the world exists or that the sky is above us and not below us. And that an apple is an apple. Now an apple may be red or green or yellow, different sizes. But the idea that defines an apple is the idea that unifies all of us in cogent ways of thinking about what we know versus what we feel versus what we must accept as a universal human truth. I encourage you to investigate more about Saul Kripke and his genius mind. It will change your day and make your life better.